Helen Fisher, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've really been looking to the conversation. It's it's great to meet you. Welcome. I'm delighted. Thank you. My pleasure. I was thinking last night uh, while I was doing some some research for this conversation that I think your subject of expertise might be the most important subject to human well-being and human flourishing, which is the subject of love. And I would love to get your um, background story as to why this resonated with you. What, what got you interested in the subject of, of love it, itself in the first place back in the day? It's just a wonderful question because most people would assume that I had a terrible love affair when I was 16 and I had to turn to understand love. Well, we nobody gets out of love alive. I mean, we all get some people that don't work. But the bottom line is um, I'm an identical twin. Hmm. And even as a small child uh, growing up, I knew there was biology to behavior because you cannot be a twin without people asking you, do you have the same cavities in your teeth? Do you have the same friends? Do you like the same food? Do you think alike about this or that, et cetera, et cetera. So I was all, long before I knew there was a nature nurture argument, controversy, uh, I knew there was biology to behavior. So I get into graduate school. And I'm it gets time to get my write my PhD dissertation. And at that time in the 1960s and 70s, um, really, um, most scientists believed that, you know, the, the mind was an empty slate and the environment um, made you who you are, molded this putty to make you who you are. And I knew it wasn't true. I knew it wasn't true. I knew there was biology to behavior. So I thought to myself, OK. Um, if there's one part of human behavior that probably has a biological origin, it would be our reproductive strategies, how we get to form some sort of partnership and make babies and send our DNA on into tomorrow. Because people who didn't do it didn't survive. Those people who did, did survive. So there would have been selection for whatever it is in the brain uh, to drive us to form partnerships and send our DNA into tomorrow. So that's really what started it. And my PhD dissertation was really on why do we form partnerships at all? 97% of mammals do not pair up to rear their young. Now, um, you know, uh, dogs do, uh, wild dogs do uh, for a period of time, you know, wolves, foxes, beavers, et cetera. There are some other mammals, but 90, about 97% do not pair up. So my first issue was why, why are we driven to form partnerships? Uh, you know, why monogamy? And then I moved on to thinking, well, hang on here. I mean, everywhere in the world, I mean, people pine for love, they live for love, they kill for love, they die for love. I mean, when you think about it, the myths, the legends, the songs, the dances, the the stories, the poems, the novels, the plays, the operas, the symphonies, the, the ballets, the holidays, the cards, the emojis. I mean, I can go on forever. But the bottom line is we are saturated absolutely saturated in the artifacts of this basic brain system. So and then I began to think, okay, you know, maybe we've evolved along with the evolution of pair bonding or monogamy um, and clandestine adultery, but forming partnerships, we must have evolved brain circuits that would drive us to fall in love with somebody and form uh, and become deeply attached. And I'll never forget my very first academic article on this. I, I was hypothesizing that we've evolved three distinctly different brain systems for mating and reproduction. Sex drive, guess you out there looking for a whole pile of people. <laughs> Romantic love enables you to focus your mating energy on just one and feelings of attachment. So anyway, I wrote this article and one of my four peer reviewers wrote in, she said, Fisher can't study romantic love. It's part of the supernatural. Hmm. I said, hang on here. You know, anger is not part of the supernatural. Fear is not part of the supernatural. Thirst and hunger are part of the supernatural. Why would this basic drive uh, be part of the supernatural? So that led me to do the brain scanning and uh, write a lot of books. At that time, when you began to realize that this was a you know, serious area of, of interest for yourself, what was available in the academic literature at that time? Had there been other people who were former youths that had dedicated so much of their careers to studying love? Or did you really kind of trailblaze a new path? 
You're a sweetheart, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good leading question. And yeah, no, I seem to have been the first. I, I mean, to my knowledge, uh, I mean, I guess I, I, I introduced this to the world, yes. Yeah. Now, there were probably, I mean, I can think of one book by Dorothy Tenoff. Uh, um, but no, even before Dorothy Tenoff and other, and people who, way back when I was doing it in the 1970s and 80s, uh, yes, uh, yes, I was, I was, I, I didn't have any companions. Yeah. And this is a very basic question, but I think an important one. When someone asks you what, is love itself? What is it? How do you how do you explain that? Yeah, I I really um, get that uh, a lot, and I generally start out by saying I think we've. Um, I, I'll start out by saying love is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. No question about that. But I study, um, you know, the brain circuitry of it, uh, and why it evolved, and uh, where we're headed today. So. Um, I be basically, I think we've evolved three distinctly different brain systems for mating and reproduction. As I mentioned, you know, sex drive gets you out there looking for a whole range of people. This your mating energy on just one at a time. And that third brain system of attachment enables you to stick with this person at least long enough to raise your children by um, by um, as a team. And then I look at the person who's asking and I say, I'm assuming that you're asking about romantic love rather than the sex drive or attachment. And they immediately say, yes, that's what they're talking about is romantic love rather than the love of a friend, uh, the love of God, uh, the love of poetry, et cetera, et cetera, romantic love. So then I say, and I, I said, well, I, you know, I, I've written a lot of books on it. And, and before I started them, I needed to know that myself. And so I began to, read the last 40 years of literature uh, describing love and also all kinds of poetry from all, I've got over a hundred poetry books um, because I think the poetry and novels, of course, and uh, and plays and operas, et cetera, are very good artifacts of what this is. And it's easy to read poetry because it's short. But anyway, from that, I was able to glean, collect um, a host of, traits that are regularly associated with romantic love. Mm. And um, the first thing that happens when you fall in love is a person takes on what I call special meaning. Everything about them is special. Their car is different from every other car in the parking lot, the street they live on, the music that they like, everything is special. And then you focus on them. You can list what you don't like about them, but you just sweep that aside and just focus on what you do. High energy, you can walk till dawn, talk all night, uh, euphoria when things are going well, despair when things begin to go poorly, all kinds of bodily reactions, uh, insomnia, loss of appetite, uh, butterflies in the stomach, weak knees, etc. Um, real emotional dependence. I mean, people will check their texts every five minutes to check their emails, check the phone, um, wait by the phone, try to drop a real emotional dependence. Separation anxiety is another um, aspect of it. You don't like to be apart. Uh, frustration, attraction, that's a term that I made up. Um, mm -hmm. Academics have long talked about frustration, aggression. When you're frustrated, you get mad. But what I've found and been able to prove it in the brain is when they don't write, they don't call, you You want them even more. And I call it frustration attraction. You just want to, you, you just get more focused on them when you don't hear from them. Real sexual desire, uh, possessiveness, jealousy, but even more, the three main characteristics of intense romantic love are, yeah, you'd like to go to bed with them, but what you really want is emotional union, a craving for emotional union. You want them to, to call, to write, to ask you out, to say that they love you. And intrusive thinking, you are there's somebody camping in your head. You are obsessively thinking about this person. And last but not least, you're highly motivated to win them. What people will do when they are in love is absolutely remarkable. So last but very least, um, it's involuntary. Um, as Stendhal, the poet, uh, writer once said, uh, love is like a fever. It comes and goes quite independently of the will. And it does. So here is a pile of, I don't know, about 14 or so traits of romantic love. And you see them in ancient um, 
Sumerian poetry, uh, Chinese poetry, uh, Arabian poetry, parts of Africa, Ethiopian songs, dances, etc. You see these same, the craving, the obsession, the constant thinking, the yearning, and the motivation to win somebody. Yeah. It's a very intense experience. People you, kill themselves for it. I think this this dovetails into um, something that I was mentioning earlier, which is that you know I, I'm at an age where a lot of people who are my friends are either married or are trying to find a long term partner. And you just said this, that, that a lot of legitimate love in your assessment is, is involuntary. You have so many great quotes related to relationships and, and love in general. And I, I think this is just an area of life where it, it's arguably the most important decision that you ever make or are among the most important decisions you ever make in terms of your judgment call of who you, you know, spend a lot of your life with. There's th- this is a quote I think I you're read. on track when you say the most important. I think you're right. Because, yeah, I think you got that right. Uh, only uh, because, you know, I mean, this is the relationship with which you're going to send your DNA on into tomorrow. Yep. This is the basic survival mechanism. This is like thirst and hunger. And, you know, when my colleagues and I put I put uh, over, we've put over 100 people into the brain scanner. And the basic brain region that is that pumps out the dopamine and makes you give have this experience lies right next to the factory that orchestrates thirst and hunger. Thirst and hunger keep you alive today. Romantic love drives you to form a partnership and send your DNA into tomorrow. So no matter whether you are, you know, Bill Gates or, you know, the girl at the laundromat, (laughs) um, whatever it is, uh, I mean, you're both doing the most important thing you can to survive, which yeah. is to form, pick the right kind of partnership and send your DNA into tomorrow. And I'd like to spend a lot of, or at least a big chunk of this conversation, getting your advice on how people can make that decision um, with the, you know, with some mindfulness, with some some wisdom. There, this is a quote that that I love that you have, which is. You fall in love with somebody who, f- who fits within what I call your love map, an unconscious list of traits that you build in childhood as you grow up. And I also think that you gravitate to certain people, actually, with somewhat complementary brain systems. I'd love for you to add some color there in terms of what you mean when you say that, and maybe specifically um, direct this to somebody who is you know, younger, not even younger, just in in general is, is interested in, you know, kind of trusting their own biology in guiding them, um, towards decision-making when it, in relation to relationships and love, what what exactly do you mean when you say that quote that I just read out? Well, there's, there's two really important parts of it. The first is your love map. And the second is the brain systems. So I'll start out with the, with the love map. Um, Uh, we tend to fall in love with somebody from the same ethnic and socioeconomic background with the same level of intelligence, good looks and education with somebody with the same religious and social values and with somebody with the same economic and reproductive. So that seems to be relatively standard. Um, uh, And so I, but you can walk into a room and everybody's from your background and level of education and good looks, and you don't fall in love with all of them. So there's got to be something. People will say, well, we have chemistry or we don't have chemistry. And that's what got me thinking, well, maybe we're naturally drawn to some people rather than others. Maybe there are brain systems that um, uh, uh, draw us to one rather than another. But back to the love map. Certainly, as you grow up, you know, you get used to your father's sense of humor, uh, your mother's uh, conscientiousness, uh, your your brother's fondness of birds, uh, your twin sisters, in my case, uh, uh, who's very adventurous. Um, and you build a conscious and unconscious list of what you're looking for in a partner. And this can change to some degree. Um, but... Uh, Um, You carry that in your head. It's very interesting. I give a lot of speeches to couples therapists and almost nobody can really list everything in their love map. Hmm. And I'll give you an example um, um, from me. My mother was uh, very unpredictable. She was very, she was 
a brilliant woman, I think, but a difficult woman and unpredictable. And I used to be quite drawn to unpredictable people because I was used to my mother. And if you had asked me to make the list of things on my love map that I'm looking for, I would never put unpredictable people. <laughs> I wouldn't have listed that. It's part of my unconscious or subconscious. It's part of my childhood. It's what I got used to. Mm. And I do think that a great many therapists help us to understand some of those motivations. Um, or you can just, you know, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I'm I'm the chief science advisor to Match.com, the internet dating site, and and um, we do an annual study, um, and I've got data now on fifty five sing uh, fifty five thousand singles. We do not poll the match members. This is a national representative sample of singles based on the U.S. Census, hmm. and um, so every every year I every yeah every year I create about two hundred questions uh, that I want to know about singles. And we we farm them out to a very fancy place, collect the data, and then it can destroy my Christmas because I get reams of this data <laughs> that I got to go over. But the bottom line is, um, you know, people's love maps are changing. I mean, 70 percent of, of men and 60 percent of women these days uh, would go out with somebody from a different ethnic group. Um, they're much less sexy, uh, uh, less uh, selective about religion. Hmm. Uh, some years they're very uh, selective about your political views. For example, when Trump was in office, that has now uh, gone by the way for the time being. And now singles are very selective about whether you've been vaccinated hmm. from COVID. So some of these things change. But when I Ask people, what are, the, what are you looking for? What do you really want? And every single year, I, and I give a list of like 30 things and you check off. Um, I, I can't remember exactly how it works, but you can check off anything you want. The top five things every single year that singles are looking for, somebody who respects them, somebody who they can um, confide in and count on. Somebody who makes them laugh, that's very interesting. That drives up the dopamine system. Laughter is very good for you. Um, somebody who makes enough time for them and somebody who they find sexually attractive. Mm. And what's interesting, since this pandemic, we, my most recent data is from, um, from um, this past summer. So it was still in pandemic times. And, and, and we asked, and there was a dramatic change before the pandemic, 2019, singles, 58% uh, of singles wanted somebody who, who wanted to marry. Today, 76% of singles want a partner who wants to marry. So it's really, um, I call it a, a post-traumatic growth. Mm. Uh, singles are growing up. You guys are growing up. And um, and you want to settle over 70% of you want to find somebody uh, to have a committed relationship within the next year. It's a very serious generation. I, I don't know if you're a millennial. Are you a millennial? Yeah. I'm crazy about millennials and Gen Z. I'm crazy about you guys because you're going to set the stage uh, for tomorrow. And you're a very serious generation. Now, I'm wandering off the second half of your question, but uh, bottom line is when I asked, you know, you know, why do you, why haven't you gotten um, you know, a partner sooner and stuck with somebody. 40% say they want self-acceptance. Um, almost a, a quarter want to get their career in order. Almost a third want financial stability. You guys are serious. And you've created a whole lot of terms, something like, you know, DTR, define the relationship. You want to know what's going on. And I even asked one year in this Singles in America study, um, well, how, how long do you go out with somebody before you ask that, have the DTR question. And I was staggered that the average was four months. Now, Helen Fisher, now maybe it's Helen Fisher, but the bottom line is in my day, I would never have thought to ask somebody within four months. To me, it would be pushing. To me, it would be, you know, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of just hang out and see how it worked out. Mm. But you guys, you do not suffer fools gladly. You're having your one night stands. You learn a lot between the sheets. 
you're not scared of getting uh, diseases. You know how to handle that. You know how to handle pregnancy. You know how, how to don't have to walk the walk of shame. So, you know, sex has turned into the sex interview. Um, and uh, in fact, 34% of you guys have had sex with somebody before the first date. Hmm. And uh, that people, older people think that's crazy. But the bottom line is these days, first days cost a lot of money. And you invest a lot of time. You got to get all dressed up. Your old guys are all such a rush. And so why not? Hop? I mean, I'm not advocating it, but I can understand it. You, you're going to hop in bed with somebody and you learn a lot. You know, not just whether they're good in, at sex, but are they patient? Are they humorous? Are they, can, do they listen, et cetera, et cetera. So you are a very serious generation. Like uh, um, other countries are calling you the new Victorians. And I think that mm. you're the new Victorians. You're a very serious generation. I, I'd like to go into the impact of, of, of why I think you're going to create stability. But now I'm wandering off your question. So I, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think I've, I've heard you speak to this in prior conversations as well about, I think your perspective of really what it what to me is all of this tinkering that seems to be going on it's kind of like testing um you know what what works for you and you, you just said i think something like 40 percent of millennials really care about self-acceptance prior to getting into a relationship what do you make of all of this uh you know tinkering and the victorian assessment of of the millennial generation i know you have a positive view of you know how high the standards often are for millennials and younger people for getting into relationships. What's your take on what's going on there? I, I call it slow love. Mm. And um, there might be a whole lot. And I'd like to hear your view too, because uh, you're a millennial. So you're going to have some, some very interesting comments, um, but I'll take a shot at it. Well, first of all, you know, in the, um, in my day, uh, people married very early. Women married in their age 21 on average and men age 22 or 23. Now they are marrying at age um, 28, 29 for women and 30, 31 for men. So there's this long period of uh, putting yourself together and um, and taking, taking care, putting yourself together. I think it is... Um, and I think that's very adaptive. I mean, I've looked in 80 cultures for the demographic yearbooks of the United Nations. And the later you marry, the more likely you are to remain together. So it's very adaptive, your care, your carefulness. But why the carefulness? That's why you, what you really asked. And I'd love to know your thing. But um, I think the young are very aware of world affairs. I mean, that's a simple answer. I think that women... Um, you know, I mean, so many people now go to college, that's four years. And then a huge percentage now go to some sort of graduate school or something else. And so they are not, they, they can't support a family, they can't have their babies until at least age 25 or so. And they still don't feel they've got a, a, a you know, uh, enough financial stability to to raise a family. I mean, these days, children are expensive. I One thing I read one time in the New York Times is even before you pay for a college education, you're paying $250,000 uh, for your children just through high school, giving them computers and automobiles and, and educational vacations and this and that. So bottom line is, um, uh, I think the, I think that all of the, um, um, parts of the life cycle are slowing down. Childhood is much longer now. Um, young adulthood is longer. Middle age is longer. Seniors, older age is, is much longer. The life cycle is, is spreading out. And of course, with people going to college, not getting out of college till 21, 22, then getting a starter job, fishing around for the right thing, then moving themselves off the ladder. It's just that they just don't feel... Um, as if they can cope with family life. And the other thing is, you know, we live so far from parents. I mean, long ago, if you had a baby and when you were very young, you had mothers and aunts and uncles and people to pass the baby to. Now we're doing it by ourselves. And so that puts a lot more pressure on marriage. We also have got so much property and it's, and it's expensive to get a divorce. 
and we want you guys want to get it right. That's very impressive. Yeah. What do I, you I, think? Why do you think people are uh, getting together later? I, I think I think a lot of what you just said is is part of it. I I do think you know this is another component which I've I've heard you speak about as well, which is the paradox of choice. Uh, yeah. Um, the the ability to just you know have a lot of not only time but you know uh, r- ability to meet a lot of people and to um you know continue to try to seek perfection or a better match or better compatibility and i think that also can be great it can also be um uh stunting in the sense that you're a bit paralyzed by making um some some longer term decisions and i think you know for for me a, a large reason why i wanted to talk to you was to try to help people get have people get your guidance on um what you know you what you think are the criteria if the goal really is a truly successful long-term partnership um even if it's not for life for many years and maybe decades to get your assessment of the research on what what seems to be the criteria for people who have found something like that. And I know you have found you you've spent a lot of your time and your research on analyzing couples that still seem to be really into each other and and in love after many many years. You just tick through a lot of the you know descriptions of why people tend to fall in love with certain types of people and not others. When somebody comes to you and as I'm sure they do many, many times and is curious about what to look for, what to feel for. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm old enough now where I have many friends who are divorced and it is absolutely brutal watching brutal. people go through that. Um, luckily, I don't have any that have had children with people that they're divorcing, but I'm sure I will live to see that. You know, To invert the question, maybe, what should you when are you not in love? When, when do you know, or when should people probably wise up and make the difficult decision to end a relationship, even if it's been going on for months or years, and you, you may even deeply care about this person, but it doesn't have the, the, the three pillars that I think you just spoke about earlier. The, the most important one maybe being that, that significant attachment or romantic attachment to someone. Um, how do you think about that? What what kind of advice would you give you know close friends or family members about well, how, how you know? That, yeah, I'm doing that with a client right now. I try not to take clients because I get too involved in them. But he's <laughs> and he's and he's got two women who want to marry him, and uh, and uh, I'm trying to help him out. Well, let me tell you several things. First of all, uh, you probably know about John Gottman. He's probably America's most important. Um, uh, a psychologist now, and he studies divorce. And he says, he calls it the four uh, horses of the apocalypse. And he said, if you got a, a you know, if there's somebody who is contemptuous, um, critical, defensive, or stonewalling, in other words, just not even engaging in any kind of issues just to, to solve anything, that's a real problem. Those are the people who are really heading towards divorce. You know, it, it, it can, you, you don't want to live with contempt, uh, criticism, uh, defensive per- people, or somebody's going to stone. You don't want to do that. You know, people in a happy relationship apparently live uh, five to seven years longer. I mean, if we, we're not playing with just your psyche. We're playing with your entire survival on the planet. So it is important to to leave when it's time to go. And in fact, I just loved, I've always loved a quote by uh, C- Confucius who said, the way out is through the door. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't people take the way out? Um, but anyway, um, um, this is what I'm doing. This is imp- an important part of, of whether you should stay or whether you should go. Um I, I like something that Obama said. Obama apparently had an intern, young man, couldn't decide whether to marry a woman. And uh, Obama said, please answer these three questions. I would add a fourth. The first one is, um, are you interested in what she has to say? Second, does she make you laugh? Hmm. Third, will she be a good mother? 
I would add a um, a fourth is, uh, does she like to kiss and hug with you? I think that sex is a very important part of a relationship. Now, if it's important to both uh, um, individuals, uh, it's important. If if it's not important to both individuals, it's okay. But that's one of the big issues in sex therapy is one person. And that's a big thing people fight about. They fight about money. They fight about children. They fight about in-laws. They fight about sex. They fight about addiction. So you don't want any of them. But let me tell you why we're naturally drawn to some people and how this can uh, have real conflicts. I think you know where I'm going. You know, I've studied the brain circuitry of personality and um, I've been able to find established that we've evolved four very broad styles of thinking and behaving linked with the dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, and estrogen system. Each one of those, there's all kinds of systems in the brain. Most of them keep the eyes blinking, the heart uh, beating. They don't have any, not linked with any personality trait. These four basic systems, each is linked with a constellation of personality traits. So what I did is I created a questionnaire, which I hope your listeners take. Um, You can go to my site, uh, theanatomyoflove.com, whatever. It's in any of my books. Anyway, the bottom line is what the questionnaire does is measure the degree to which you take when in, to which you express the traits in each four of these brain systems. So now it, we express all of them, but we express some more than others. So for example, I'm very high dopamine. You probably are too. These people are risk-taking, novelty-seeking, curious, creative, spontaneous, energetic, and mentally flexible people. And as it turns out, they're drawn to people like themselves. I call them explorers. Explorers look for explorers. My data comes from uh, over 15 million people have taken this questionnaire in 40 countries. And it's the only questionnaire in the world that is backed up by my brain scanning. No other questionnaire is backed up by brain scanning. So what I mean by that is if you take the questionnaire, I've been able to prove that uh, if you score high on dopamine on my questionnaire, you also show more activity in the dopamine system. So bottom line is people who are explorers, high dopamine, curious, creative, spontaneous, energetic, are drawn to people like themselves. People who are high on the serotonin system, Mike Pence is a good example, Mitt Romney and his wife are good examples, Um, traditional, conventional, follow the rules, respects authority, detail-oriented, managerial, often religious, but not always, uh, conscientious, Um, they are also drawn to people like themselves. Other traditional, conventional, cautious, um, detail-oriented, managerial, conscientious people like themselves. In the other two categories, testosterone and estrogen, they're drawn to their opposite. Uh, I think Bill and Hillary Clinton are a good example. She's, I think, the higher testosterone. These people tend to be analytical, logical, direct, decisive, tough-minded, skeptical, and good at what we call rule-based systems, everything from math to engineer to computing, um, uh, et cetera. And they're good at music too. They are drawn, I call them directors. They are drawn to their opposite. I call them negotiators. These people, are, they see the big picture. Um, uh, they see long-term. Um, they're very good people skills. They're good at reading posture, gesture, tone of voice, the linguistically skilled, uh, compassionate, empathetic, um, and imaginative. And they are drawn to people, their opposite. So what I do with a client, I've done it a couple of times recently, is I have the person take the questionnaire, my client, and um, I have that person ask their person they're trying to decide on whether they're going to marry or not to take the questionnaire also. And I can see where they will be very compatible and where they will have difficulties. Two people who are very high on the uh, dopamine system may well have problems with addiction. Uh, so you check that one out, but they're not, they're going to have a ball together. They're both going to be highly sexual. Uh, they're both going to want to race off to the theater or the opera or to Spain or wherever. Uh, they're going to be curious, creative, and they're going to love that in each other. They're going to like it. If that kind of person is going out with somebody who's very high serotonin, who is not adventurous, and not as creative, but very solidly based. It might be the right uh, uh, kind of person to have children with, Mm. Um, pooling the resources of two different thinking styles. 
But after a while, this person might get bored hmm. and, and say, you know, well, why don't you want to go to Alaska and, and see the, you know, the, the, um, you know, the midnight sun and, and, and the other person might say, well, I can see it on television. I like staying home cooking for you, you know, and there will be frustrations. I'm not saying that they can't be overwritten, but it's nice going into a partnership where you have the same interests and drives, et cetera, and where you are biologically similar and different and, uh, and, and how to cope with that. Now, for example, me, I got married last year. At age 75, God, I mean, prior to that, I, mean, I had lovely, wonderful, long love affairs, but I never saw the point. I really get the point now. I keep on learning about love. But the bottom line is he and I are both very high dopamine. Hmm. And we just came back from wandering through Spain. And, uh, and uh, you know, we read together all the time. We go to the opera. It works fine. He's very high testosterone and I'm very high estrogen. That works fine too. It's once again a natural match. Hmm. But he's higher on serotonin than I am. He follows the rules and respects authority more than I do. And for example, we were going to the movies, oh, I don't know, a year ago or so. And I said, sweetheart, uh, you know, do you have any um, water in your backpack? And he said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, we can drink it in the movie house. And he said, no, we can't. You can't bring food or lick drinks into the movie house you got to buy it at the concession stand well you know that hadn't dawned on me <laughs> <laughs> but rather than go to a therapist or take it personally or anything i figured oh he's higher on the serotonin system he likes to respect the rules i'm going to buy the water in the movie house i mean so i think it's a valuable this this a way of of um, understanding the sick, you know, it's basically two parts of personality, everything you grew up to, to believe, do and say, that's your love map. And the second is this biology, these four basic brain systems, each with a constellation of personality traits that really play a role in, in your daily life. Yeah. And so ju just to summarize in your experience, right? Like, Given the categories that you just articulated and you're familiar with in in relationships and in love, what seem to be the great matches, the great compatibility matches that people might want to keep in mind when they're, you know, searching, dating, trying to understand themselves? How, how do you think about that? Um, well, the great matches are are two people who are high dopamine, mm. uh, and also one of them is high testosterone and one is high estrogen. I've dated on 28,000 uh, people and I've watched, um, you know, uh, uh, who's drawn to whom. And um, I have a little data on long-term successful marriages. Uh, it's only one thing, but um, actually I need a student to go in and do that for me because I can't do that on match.com. They don't study long successful marriages. But as it turns out, dopamine is drawn to dopamine. Serotonin is drawn to, you know, curious, creative is drawn to people like themselves. Um, traditional, conventional people, cautious, are drawn to people like themselves. High testosterone, analytical, logical, direct, decisive is drawn to their opposite. High estrogen, seeing the big picture, verbal skills and people skills. So if you can find a partnership, let's say you're both high. Uh, how about Mike Pence? How about Mitt Romney? Got lots of children. Seems to be very stable relationships. Uh, she appears to be just as high on the serotonin system as he is. Hmm. And she also appears very high estrogen and he appears very high, uh, high um, testosterone. Hillary and Bill Clinton. Well, it's had its, its tumbles, but, <laughs> but uh, they're still together. And uh I think he, I think Bill is the high estrogen. I mean, you know, people always say, when are we going to have our first female president? Frankly, I think we've had our first female president. I mean, he, the whole world knows he can't stop talking. His book is over, what is it, 900, 600 or 900 pages long, his autobiography. Um, um, he was worried terribly about crying at his daughter's wedding. Uh, he's very good with people, uh, very verbally skilled. And I think that uh, he's uh, 
Um, I mean, certainly got some testosterone in him, no question about that. But I think he's also very high estrogen, which was probably patterned in the womb. And they go for high testosterone. So he went for Hillary. In fact, I, I got this one wonderful quote about Hillary. Somebody asked her why she liked um, liked Bill. And she said, he wasn't afraid of me. Mm. Now, that's a high testosterone answer. Yeah, I would never dream of saying that myself. I'm just, people aren't afraid of me, uh, but I'm not high testosterone. So the bottom line is, certainly your childhood plays a role. Certainly your background and level of intelligence and good looks and you know uh, social and and economic and reproductive goals they all play a role. But so do these these basic foundational brain systems that naturally draw you to one person rather than another. And if people could go and take my questionnaire and also um, take give their would-be partner the questionnaire, they could see where if they are both high in dopamine or both low in dopamine, both high in serotonin, both low in serotonin, one's high in testosterone, one's high in estrogen. Take a look at the variations in that and you can begin to figure out um, where the bumps will be, yeah, and where the compatibility will be. <clears throat> there was a one. Uh, this is a former guest on on this show. I, I was just watching an interview of him yesterday. <clears throat> I'm assuming. I, I bet you know his name, David Buss. Oh, sure, the, very the, well. The yeah, I, I emailed him yesterday. <laughs> great, great guy. I, I emailed him yesterday too. Um, he he lives in in Austin, where I live, and. I've had him on the show. He was one of the first five guests. I met him at his house. An amazing mind, an amazing guy. And the podcast that I was just watching him on uh, yesterday, he was talking. Th- this these same sort of subjects were talking uh, were coming up, and I, I, there's a lot of overlap in my mind between how you're approaching love and relationships and the way he thinks about human nature and and love and partnerships. And one of the um, observations he made is that one of the you were mentioning John Gottman earlier, and I, this was uh, David's take on what can lead to the downfall of a relationship. And he was talking about emotional instability, which, as I understand the big five personality traits, which is a just sort of pet interest of mine, uh, acronym for the the big five personality traits is Ocean. The N being neuroticism. Which I think I think is exactly it basically that it's it's um, the propensity for for negative emotion, anxiety, and depression, which I think on average tends to be slightly higher in women than men at a macro level. But you know, for for people that would group themselves in that category, that know they have some propensity for neurotic a neurotic mind, but are still interested in you know, having a, a partnership, they know maybe it's going to be a little harder for them because they, as I understand it, that is one of the the elements of, um, uh, 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 you know, human being psychology that can really be make, make partnerships difficult. What can they do to try to, you know, mitigate the risk of their own neuroticism torpedoing a relationship? Um, I'm not sure if that's something that you've thought about or studied, but I'd be curious to get your thoughts about that. I, I certainly haven't studied it, so I'm just going to be another layman. Um, well, it's worth getting over, for God's sakes, uh, you know, understanding what it is, uh, what triggers it. I mean, it's anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I have people in my life now, not not, not close friends, but uh, uh, who need to get over their anxiety right now. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, um and and it, and it and it triggers panic attacks, so it's serious. And um, with her, she said that if she can feel it coming. Maybe if she could go play the piano, something that fo- gets her focused on something, so the anxiety goes away. It was very interesting. I I was watching this TV program. It's a series called uh, Life Below Zero, and it's about some real old about real people living in Alaska. And one of them is a young, charming girl, Agnes. She's in her 50s, actually. She's had a lot of children. But anyway, uh, they go ice fishing in the winter. And if you fall through the ice, you're dead. You're gone. They, you never even find the body again. Um, and her mother had gotten lost, dropped it, fall, fallen into the ice. And so had her brother and her brother's wife. So she was really scared. And at one point, you see them and her husband 
uh, you see Agnes getting more and more nervous about, because they, they have to cut a hole in the ice and that can make the ice around it more fragile. And you can see her getting more and more anxious. And her husband turns to her and says, Agnes, start whistling. Oddly enough, it began to occur to me, wow, when you put your face in a different pose, and that's going to trigger different brain circuitry. Mm -hmm. And when you're actually focusing on something, and it's a melody rather than the environment around you, that is an Eskimo or an Inuit mechanism for anxiety uh, uh, disruption. Now, I think an awful lot of people would use... um, um, a cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for it, or get more exercise, or eat a lot less sugar, mm. or, and stay away from uh, people who make you so anxious. <laughs> uh, and I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, and so that's the best I can do on that one. Yeah. <laughs> what I, did I, David I, say? Um, I don't know that he addressed that specifically in terms of how one might mitigate the risk. I think he was just making the observation in general that that you know, if, if you are not someone who is particularly high in neuroticism, it probably makes sense to find someone who is not neurotic. Bit, exactly. Yeah. You I, know, it's interesting. You talked about the big five and ocean and what the big, um, uh, I have compared my questionnaire, which is based on brain circuitry and the big five is not. Mm. Um, and so have some people in Israel, they've gone and also taken my, used my questionnaire, it's called the Fisher Temperament Inventory, and um, the Big Five, and compared them in Israel. And um, my study and them show exactly the same thing, that, okay, so um, ocean, open open to new experiences. It's the, they're measuring the dopamine system. Hmm. It's actually absolutely positively correlated with my dopamine system. Conscientiousness. Absolutely. That's the second of the big five for people who are listening. Um, Absolutely positively correlates with conscientiousness, uh, with serotonin in Mm -hmm. my system. Um, The other one, OCE, extroversion, introversion. I think they've got that wrong. We could go into that. I think everybody's got that one wrong, Um, but we can go into that. Um, uh, OCE, OCE, A, agreeableness. Yeah. What they found was that, and I found it too, that people who are, very agreeable are high estrogen and people who are less agreeable are high testosterone. And so we found, so three out of the Hmm. uh, five are absolutely correlate. I didn't study neuroticism um, in my questionnaire. uh, And uh, um, I think they got um, the extroversion and introversion uh, mismeasured. So bottom line is um, there's something to be said for the big five, at least three of them uh, are, uh, 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 now is correlated with brain systems because they're correlated with my personality questionnaire. Yeah. I, I know in addition to, you know, work like yours, work like David, evolutionary psychology, it, it, just in the zeitgeist of my friend group. And I think a lot of people who are roughly in my age and, and cohort in general, a very popular book <laughs> related to love and relationships that has gained a lot of, I think, momentum and popularity is a, is a book about attachment styles. Uh-huh. And, and my understanding about the, the three primary perspectives that were offered in this book were um, secure, which would be the, the goal, a uh, secure attachment style, um, uh, basically anxious or um, avoidant. Uh, avoidant. avoidant. This is such old material, Dan. I am staggered. I'm glad. I'm glad it's living this long, but it is not original. I mean, it's fine. I mean, I don't. Things don't have to be original to be absolutely useful. I'm absolutely, and I and I completely agree with it. It. I mean, this is it, this has been said a long time ago. And I'm, what what's the name of the book? I think it's called Attached. The name of the book I think is Attached. Uh-huh. And I I I've, I've been wanting to talk to someone, uh, and I, I would love to get your thoughts on this because. You know, from my perspective, I think there probably is something to these categories of Absolutely. secure, um, avoidant, and anxious. I I also wonder what you, we, we've talked about. You know, your love map um, or, or individuals' love love map and compatibility. And uh, given that it's probably a good rough heuristic to keep in mind for your own identity, I I've always wondered if you know different people really trigger based on your compatibility, based upon maybe your love map, 
various attachment styles that you know people who don't map up with you particularly well may make you anxious or avoidant and others who really are a good match for you bring out a more secure you know stable side to your your love life i i don't know if this is um a subject that you've thought about about how do you how do you think about that i think it makes it makes a great deal of sense to me i mean the thing is you know we're all impacted i don't like that word we you know uh, by um the people around us and if people are kind and sweet we're more inclined to be kind and sweet and if they're a great there's good studies of that in business you get a team of people and one person is um stealing from the till then you find other people stealing from the till and if you find somebody who's very aggressive you get other people who end up being aggressive who aren't anywhere near as naturally aggressive as that so we do change but I don't think that we um, really changed dramatically. Um, I do think that if you grew up, I mean, th- this is basic data. If you grew up in a, in, a, in a home where you had a very good, solid relationship with both parents, you are more likely to be the first of those stability. What is it? Stable, stable Secure, even? I think is Securely how you put it. Attached. Yeah. You're, 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 you're likely to go into a relationship um, expecting to make a secure attachment, uh, sort of, uh, with the tools to make the secure attachment yourself. So I do think that um, your childhood certainly plays a role and certainly the people around you definitely play a role. And that, you know, so, um, I mean, avoidant attached. Okay. So let's say you're the securely attached kind of person, but um, you end up with an alcoholic who is very unpredictable and I can see where you would start to swing into being uh, 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 avoidant or, or anxious, uh, you know, uh, around that person more than you would if you were with somebody else. So I do think that we have there's biology to behavior that uh, a good, good, secure childhood is going to enable you to go into a relationship that is that is. Um, uh, seeking security, knowing what security is, and having the tools yourself to to make them. Um, but you know, one of the problems right now, I've never said this before nor thought of it, but one of the problems in terms of securely attached and all this, it seems almost now I might get clobbered for this one, but uh, seems as if it's almost fashionable now to to feel a little mentally ill. It seems almost fashionable to be taking all these kinds of drugs to to calm you down and speed you up and all that kind of thing. And, and, uh, you know, I just was doing a, uh, uh, doing a, a, a client, you know, conversation and this guy was on so many drugs. He wanted to know whether he was, should stay with a particular woman. How would he know? Yeah. He's on so many drugs. You know, when you take an SSRI like Prozac or Paxil, now some people need those drugs to get out of bed in the morning. No question about it. But uh, psychiatrists have said, Harvard psychiatrists said about 73% of people who are taking those drugs long-term don't need them. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they blunt the emotions. That's the point of taking them. You blunt the emotions. What you're doing is you're driving up serotonin and that's suppressing the dopamine system. It's the dopamine system that is linked with romantic love. And these people wonder why they haven't fallen in love for the last five years. They're too dulled out. They're too numb. They're feeling good. You know, they like their life, but they're not progressing into a really um, exciting partnership because they don't have it in them. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing the amount of drugs that we take. I, I even think, you know, the day may come on, I don't know, on any dating site where people say, well, I'm a 32 year old girl. I do this and this and this. I'm taking this, this and this drug, uh, you know, so that at least people going to talk to them know how, how their mind is being um, fiddled with. Yeah. One of my favorite conversations I've had on this show was with, uh, he, I think is probably the most prolific Jungian writer and thinker in America, Jim Hollis. And he, he has a very interesting take on, uh, depression in general, which I, uh, giving the point that you just made, which is that some people definitely, I think need to be on these substances, but I, I think the number you cited was something like 70 or 73%. He, he, 
the question he often asks his clients who come to ask, who come to see him, who are grappling and dealing with, you know, some, some pretty serious depression is asking the question, why has this depression come? Why is it here in the first place? You know, why is your subconscious autonomously rebelling against your decisions and lifestyle that you are pursuing? Which I think it, it, it's an, uh, it can be a helpful question to ask for people who are trying to navigate some difficult times in, in their life. There's some yeah. other quotes that, that you, that you have, no, which you I love. Say that, uh, say that for a moment. This why question is something that a great many um, psychiatrists, therapists, psychologists address. Hmm. And the AA Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't do that. It focuses on fixing it. They don't even, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I just know a lot about that, that thing, uh, that system. And I think you need, need both. And I'm sure that, um, y- 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 you know, the person you were speaking with knows that. But I think that uh, it's one thing to understand why you hate your mother, why you such and such, why you, why you can't get to work, uh, why you just, but it's another issue. And I think the second half of the puzzle of, okay, you know why? Big deal. What are we going to do about it? Yep. That I think is the world that I live in. Yep. There is a, I didn't even realize this was your quote until last night when I was doing research for this conversation. I've had this quote up on my website for quite some time, which is, um, this is from you. At first I assumed hate was the opposite of love, but it isn't. The opposite of love is indifference, uh, which I think is a profound idea. I, I you know, I was thinking during this conversation that I'm with you and I I think it's important to try to set big goals and do the best you can to, uh, you know, encourage your friends and family to find great matches and same with yourself. You know, we're all flawed and none of us are perfect. And, you know, I I think the search for utopia um, can be very foolish in certain areas, but you know, that, that idea that the opposite of love is indifference, even in the best of relationships, I have to imagine that there are times where, uh, you know, there is a little bit of struggle and maybe you disagree with that, but I, I, I'm wondering for yourself, what you think the role of, you know, commitment and endurance is in, you know, some relatively turbulent times. Like, how do you think about the, the difference between, you know, two messy people, who really do care about each other, navigating a long-term partnership versus a relationship that has gotten to a state of indifference or has gotten to a state where it's really, you know, the compatibility differences are becoming obvious. How do you think about that? Well, I'll, you know, I'm a high dopamine girl and uh, I think life is short. And in my particular case, I wouldn't be able to tolerate it. Yeah. Um, now other people can tolerate it for a million different reasons. I mean, they have no livelihood other than their partner. Their partner's very rich. They've got houses here and there. They can't bear to leave the family dog, whatever it is. And so, you know, people are going to tolerate indifference in, in different ways and depending on what their lifestyle is and what they need and don't need. And some of them are willing to, you know, get their um, uh, thrills uh, outside of the marriage um, by, by anything from going out every night with girlfriends and going to the opera or finding another sweetheart who just adores them, uh, et cetera. So people are, are I, I think, uh, can tolerate different things. They're looking for different things. But here's something that I'm, I'm, I'm positive of. I and my colleagues put 15 people in long-term, very happy marriages into the brain scanner. And they all came into the lab or went and said, I'm still in love with her. I'm still in love with him. Now, Americans in the world does not believe that you can re- find somebody and remain in love long term. Mm-hmm. So we decided we put these people in the brain scanner. They were all in their 50s and 60s. Most of them had adult children into the scanner and see what makes a long term happy marriage. Now, psychologists will say a whole pile of things that makes a happy marriage. All good. But this is what the brain says. There's three brain regions that become active in a long-term, very happy, and very romantic marriage. A brain region linked with empathy, 
a brain region linked with controlling your own stress and your own emotions, and a brain region linked with what we call positive illusions, the ability to overlook what you don't like about somebody and focus on what you do. And there's a huge, so you say, well, what about these people who are indifferent? Well, maybe, I mean, have they, have they, have they tried to, I mean, you can try to trigger romantic love by going, doing novel things together. Mm -hmm. Novelty drives up the dopamine system in the brain. It can trigger uh, feelings of intense romantic love. This is why vacations are so interesting. As long as you go someplace new, (laughs) you're going to the same old camp grounds in Indianapolis, whatever, it's not new. Um, So any novelty, 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 it'll drive up the dopamine system. Um, if you want to uh, perk up the sex uh, sex drive, you want to perk up all three brain systems, um, romantic love, sex drive, and attachment uh, to, 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 to stimulate the sex drive, have sex. Um, plan it. We plan every other part of our life, plan it. Um, because when you have sex with somebody, um, good sex with a partner you've had for a long time, um, any stimulation of the genitals drives up dopamine, can push you over the threshold into falling, re- getting back in love. With orgasm, there's a real flood of oxytocin linked with feelings of attachment. And also, as you're having sex, you're driving up the androgens and testosterone. So sex can stimulate all three of these basic brain systems, sex drive, romantic love, feelings of attachment. Novelty, novelty, novelty. Uh, have sex. And how do you stimulate attachment? Um, stick together. Um, anytime you hug somebody or kiss somebody, you're driving up the oxytocin system in the brain. Get rid of the two big chairs to watch television and sit together on a couch. Every time you are uh, in physical contact with somebody, you're driving who you like. Uh, you might be indifferent, but at least you don't hate them. Um, you know, you can, you're driving. Uh, learn to at least start out by sleeping in that person's arms. Even if you go to bed at different times, collect the other person, agree on that, or lie in bed together in the morning and have a conversation about the day instead of getting up and moving around and doing it. Any kind of physical contact can sustain feelings of deep attachment. So if I needed, if I, what I say to people is number one, you want to express these three brain systems, empathy, controlling your own stress, your own, Uh, and your own emotions, positive illusions, overlooking what you don't like, focusing on what you do, and also stimulate all three of these basic brain systems, sex drive, romantic love, and feelings of deep attachment. The last thing that you can do is say nice things uh, to your partner. As it turns out, um, when you say nice things to your partner, it helps their blood pressure, uh, their immune system, other physiological processes in them, but also in you. So just saying something nice to the partner uh, uh, can work too. If you're profoundly indifferent is different from disliking somebody. Yeah. I mean, really disliking somebody. You're asking, you're not asking a psychologist, you're asking an anthropologist and a neuroscience. Personally, I think life is short. I think I'd find a way out. Uh, you know, for millions of years, we lived in these little hunting and gathering groups. And um, anthropologists now are quite convinced that <clears throat> in the past, uh, both men and women tended to have a series of partnerships, a two or three um, basic marriages. And I wrote a whole book on this. Why would the, why we why would we fall madly in love, form a partnership, get to know everybody in the little clan or whatever, then have a child and then leave and find a new one? What would be the point of that? And finally, occurred to me a series of partnerships. If you have a series of partnerships with different people, you might have more than children by more than one partner. And from a Darwinian evolutionary perspective, you've created more genetic variety in your young and um, who might who might be likely to survive. So we are probably a creature who evolved a tremendous drive to fall in love, to form a partnership, to stick together at least long enough to have one child together as a team. If the relationship is not compatible, break up, form a new partnership, and have more children with subsequent partners. That's probably what we were built for, unless you got it right the first time. <laughs> And then you stick with the person and have a lot of babies. So it's a basic Darwinian 
we're almost, I call it the four year itch. Uh, that from I looked in in the um, demographic yearbooks of the United Nations, and if you're going to divorce around the world in 80 cultures, you tend to divorce about the third or fourth year of marriage, which for millions of years was when your child was out of infancy. So um, we have this tendency, but I do really think that your generation is going to counteract that because you're marrying so much later. The other reason that I think it might counteract that is that uh, I've I've studied in this fifty five thousand people uh, on, on, on singles in America study with Match. As it turns out, today when we ask where did you meet your last first date, forty um, percent of singles say on the internet hmm. through the internet. Good twenty five percent say through a friend. Uh, less than ten percent uh, in a bar, a restaurant, at, at school, uh, in a religious place, etc. So, the vast majority of Americans today are meeting people first on the internet. And an article came out from University of Chicago that pointed out that if you met on the internet, anywhere on the internet, as opposed to off the internet, you were m- less likely to divorce. Hmm. And I thought to myself, what what difference does it make where you meet somebody? I mean, you can meet them in an airport, you can meet them in a bar, you can meet them in, in a in a theater. What difference does it make? So I did my own study of of uh, five thousand people, and I studied those who met um, their last first date on the internet as opposed to met their last first date off the internet. And as it turns out, people who date on the internet are more likely to have advanced education, more likely to be fully employed, and more likely to be looking for a committed partnership. So this is, we're marrying later, and the later you wed, the more likely you are to stay together, and we are meeting on the internet, and therefore people who want commitment. These two things is what your generation is doing. Hmm. Slow love, careful love, meeting on the internet where there are other people who want to to uh, form a real partnership, you're going to bring, a, I really think you're going to usher in a few decades of relative family stability. Mm. You're a very cool generation. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're doing what we can. Um, <laughs> I, I, know, I know we're getting relatively close to the end of the conversation. And I, I wanted to go over maybe one or two more subjects with you before we, we close this off. And you know, one is first of all. It seems like, um, if I'm understanding your perspective on, you know, advice you would have, that it really helps to increase or you know find a lifestyle that can bump up your dopamine and mitigate your you know, propensity for negative emotion. And one thing that has just always kind of baffled me about the human experience is how malleable the, the mind really is. And that, you know, one day if you're exhausted and stressed and miserable, you feel a certain way. And the, the next day you can feel you know better than you ever had it have in your life. And so if I'm understanding your you know, perspective on what might really increase your likelihood for being a, you know, the sort of person that can maintain a, a great relationship, I think creating a lifestyle that really suits you and is playing to your strengths might be something to keep in mind. I don't know if that's kind of how perfect. you think about that. That's perfect. Uh, people, uh, 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 people, um, absolutely. When you can be who you are, who you really are at work and outside of work, uh, you, you do much better. It's so interesting because, uh, you know, I'm writing my next book on this. It's going to be applying all this to business partner relationships or, you know, outside of the love world anyway. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I was, I was doing a workshop with Deloitte and I asked about a hundred senior partners. It was a workshop. I said, where are you more, more, more yourself at work or outside of work? Almost all of them were more themselves at work because as one guy summed it up, he said, well, I really love my wife and my children, but I do have to compromise when I'm at home. When I'm at work, I can be entirely myself. Mm-hmm. And then I did a study with uh, 
with some women in Singapore, uh, and they worked for company Axo Nobel, which is almost, it's a paint and finishing company. It's almost all thousands of, of male engineers. And I asked them when they could be most likely be themselves. And they said, oh, at home, you know, at work, we have to, um, you know, we have to, uh, uh, you know, be aggressive and get to the point and, and be skeptical and all the kinds of things that link with the testosterone system. So ap- you're absolutely right, Dan, you know, uh, the best thing is to find a partner who likes who you really are mm-hmm. and, um, and uh, find a uh, uh, get yourself in some sort of work that uh, enables you to be who you really are. And this is, once again, you guys, you millennials, you're very entrepreneurial. <laughs> and uh, I think entrepreneurs are uh, uh, capable of, of being themselves uh, more than fitting into a, you know, a hierarchical uh, system. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's valuable to know who you are and then uh, find a world where you don't have to be somebody else. Yeah, fair enough. Last question I want to ask you, and I know, you know, as you as you said earlier in this conversation, I think it was last year you got married at age seventy five. Um, I don't know if you had been married previous previously, but yeah, I know you live in Manhattan. You, you sound sounds like you have an amazingly interesting life um, in that city and in general. How do you think about the importance of marriage? in our society. And, you know, I, I know people who are not seemingly particularly interested or inclined, including women in getting married and, um, and some who are, are you prescriptive in recommending that institution for all or nearly all people? Um, and how did, how have you thought about, you know, marriage in your life? It, It sounded like from what you said earlier in the conversation that there was a time where, it didn't necessarily make sense to you, and now it does. Um, I'd love to just close in getting your thoughts on that in general. You know, I really haven't had a chance to say this. It's so interesting. You know, I'm I am apparently the most quoted person on love in the world today. <laughs> now, that's not because it's Helen Fisher. It's because I do, do brain scanning, and that's what's new, and I write a lot of books on it. But I was never personally interested in marriage. Um, I've had... Um, before getting married, I had two very long uh, partnerships with men. And I thought to myself all during that, what's the point of a piece of paper? I'm not going to abandon them until they, you know, unless they die. Uh, Whatever I got, I'll I'll leave to them. I'm with them all the time. Um, um, We're well known as a couple. Uh, Why... Do I need a piece of paper? And so I did have a very short starter marriage a few months (laughs) when I was 23. I would not have married him, but I was too scared of my mother to say I didn't want to do it. (laughs) But so I did it and got right out of it. I was stupid. I was young and stupid. But the bottom line is I did not understand until I met the man that I'm married to now the value of marriage. Now, here I am. (laughs) <laughs> pretty well known for studying love and certainly appreciating married people, but I, I got it intellectually. I know it's a socially logical thing. You share your money, you share your time, you share your children, you share your kin, you share your problems. I could, I could understand all that, mm. but emotionally I didn't get it. And now I do. And as I've said to him, I said, why is this different? And he said, he always says the same thing. He's a, he said, it's richer and deeper. And that's what it is. So I'm not in the prescription business. Uh, what people should or shouldn't do is their thing. But all I can tell you from years and years and years of not understanding the depths and joys of marriage, as opposed to living with somebody in the whole deal, it is different. Mm. And in my case, it's a thrill. And I, I, you know, we are built to form partnerships and, uh, and have them be socially sanctioned partnerships. And that's what a a wedding is. And so all I can tell you is that my thinking was wrong. And now I finally get it. And what's so interesting to me about getting it is now I look at particularly men's wedding rings. 
uh, you see a lot of women's wedding rings, but when I see a wedding ring on a man. I get it now hmm. that he, that he's still hopefully crazy about this woman, dedicating his life, sacrificing things to to it to do it. I will say this about marriage, though: you want to marry somebody who opens more doors than than shuts them. Hmm. You don't want to give up things uh, to marry. You want to acquire joy, forgiveness, understanding empathy, uh, a, a real partner. I mean, I, I wouldn't marry somebody who <clears throat> shut a lot of doors. Mm-hmm. I think you got to marry somebody who opens them and gives you a new and better life. And to sneak in one final question related to that, was it really him and the two of you together that made you, as you said, experience something, you know, I think you said richer and deeper, you know, that you didn't know that that was out there. And when you you know, got to know this guy, uh, it triggered, um, I don't know, like another evolution in your thinking about the partnership. How how do you think about, you know, what, how you changed, how you evolved in that way? Well, he, he was his idea to marry me. It wasn't my idea. I, it's hard for him to believe it, but it never dawned on me to marry him. I knew I'd be with him as long as we were ever together. I certainly hoped I'd die with him or, you know, and that we'd live the rest of our lives together. I mean, I've been going out with him for seven years. It didn't really, I never asked him to marry me, didn't think about it. It was, it was his idea. And at the time, I thought it was charming. I, it's just charming. It's just, I guess, a little bit like inviting me to go to the moon. Uh, okay, well, why not? I'll try it. I mean, I'll be with you forever. It's, if you, that works for you, it's fine with me. And I'm still charmed. I'm, it's 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 sort of magical. I mean, we, we we're calling it the endless honeymoon. Um, we don't argue. Uh, we got so probably has some positive illusions about me. There's things he's able to look over. I don't overlook. I don't know. Don't know. Won't ask. Um, but I, I, I it was his idea, and and through doing it. I basically say to him, I now understand what most teenage girls get. Mm. They, they, they understand what marriage is. And at, at age 75, I figured that out. <laughs> yeah. And the richness and the depthness, if I'm understanding you, was a result of the, getting married. That, that, yeah. that, that triggered something else. Yes, it triggered. I mean, so I've always been quite confident that the men that I was living with wasn't going to leave me. And and it was true. I was confident. I don't know. It's just richer and deeper. I'm not a psychologist. It's marriage is good. I recommend it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Helen, this was such a pleasure. Um, I, I, it's a it's a privilege to be able to do this and to meet you. Um, I really appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge and, and wisdom. Um, thanks so much for coming on the show and making the time. It was wonderful. Thank you, kid. It was really charming for me, too. Likewise. Thank you for listening to this episode of Keep Talking. If you're finding value in this podcast, please consider supporting the show via the links below on Venmo, PayPal, or Patreon. Your support helps to make these conversations possible.